We're going to continue with this, the tenth chapter of the Revenge of the Wizard's Ghost. And I have to apologize, I have a cold at the moment. So Johnny and the Professor are trying to figure out what they can, not Johnny and the Professor, Fergie and the Professor are trying to figure out what they can do at the estate to help Johnny. They were not able to find the Urim and the Thummim yet, and Fergie is about to take a bath as we go back to the beginning of the paragraph where the last video cut off. When Fergie lowered himself into the tub, the hot water felt wonderful. He soaked himself and hummed and closed his eyes and tried to imagine that everything was all right. But then he thought of Johnny, and gloom descended on him again. Their great mission had failed, and now Johnny was probably going to die. Fergie felt absolutely helpless. What could he do? What could anyone do? He thought about the dead dog and the nightmarish salt caves and the fake tomb of Ensign French. There was something evil out at the Windrow Estate, something that seemed to be lurking in the shadows and laughing at them. Was there a ghost? He didn't know. But he did know that every clue they had followed had led them to a dead end. They had lost, and they might as well pack up and go home. After he had finished his bath, Fergie put his terry cloth robe on and padded back to the bedroom. The professor was in his pajamas, sitting at the oval table near the window. He had set up his peg chest set, and he had pulled up a chair for Fergie. Greetings, Byron, said the professor, smiling sadly. Well, here we are, two would be the two would be explorers. We didn't do so well, did we? But as they say, tomorrow's another day, and during the night one of us will have a brainstorm and solve the riddle of Ensign French and the Urim and the Thummim. Until then, I suggest that we play chess. There's nothing more that we can do tonight. Fergie won the first two games, but the professor was pretty good at chess, and he came back to win the third. By that time it was pretty late, and the professor began to yawn a lot. He decided that it was time to hit the sack. But Fergie was not sleepy yet, so he sat up in the easy chair, by the window and read the book on heraldry. Time passed. It was almost midnight when Fergie happened to turn his head and glance out at the deserted town square below. Deserted? Well, not quite. Not far from one of the benches, a man was standing. He was near the edge of a pool of lamplight, so Fergie really couldn't get a good look at him, but he looked old and he had gray hair that hung down to his shoulders. He's probably just some old bum, thought Fergie, and he was about to go back to his book when something else attracted his attention. The old man was standing very still, and he seemed to be staring straight up at the window Fergie was looking out of, and by some trick of the lamplight, the old man's eyes were glowing red. Fergie shuddered, and he stared hard. Then he closed his eyes and turned away, and when he looked again, the old man was gone. When Fergie woke, on su when Fergie woke up Sunday morning, bright sunlight was streaming in through the window, and he could hear church bells ringing. The professor was sitting by the chair, was sitting in the chair by the window, and he was wearing his blue pinstriped suit. In his hands was a small paperback edition of Five Tragedies by William Shakespeare. The professor was really wrapped up in the book, and he never noticed when Fergie stared at him and coughed two or three times to get his attention. Finally, the professor looked up and smiled faintly. Oh, hello, Byron, he said in a vague, dreamy tone. Can I help you with anything? Fergie didn't know what to say. Should he tell the professor about the old man with the glowing eyes? He decided not to. Fergie liked to think that he was a tough kid who didn't scare easily. He told the professor that he had been frightened by an old bum. If he told the professor that he had been frightened by an old bum, the professor would kid him, and Fergie did not want that. After he thought about Johnny again, and in spite of being a tough guy, he found that he was having trouble keeping back tears. What? "'What the heck are we going to do, Professor?' he asked in a cracked, weary voice. "'Do we just pack up and go home, or what?' The professor laid the book down on a table. He took off his glasses and pinched the bridge of his nose. "'You would ask hard questions like that, wouldn't you?' he said with a wry chuckle. He put his glasses back on and glared defiantly at Byron. <laughs> "'I'll tell you what we are not going to do, in case you were wondering.' he said in a voice that rose steadily in pitch. We are not going to give up! The Urim and the Thummim are out there at that rotten estate, and we are going to find them if we have to tear Zeb's wind Zeb Windrow's church and his mansion down stone by stone! The professor paused. He saw that his ranting had startled Fergie, so he, looked, so he forced himself to smile in a reassuring way. Look, Byron, he said in a milder tone, I didn't mean to take your head off. But I'm just as angry and frustrated as you are. When you woke up a minute ago, I was trying 
to forget about my troubles by reading Shakespeare, but it seems that everything I read leads me back to the puzzle of Edson French. I was reading Othello, and at the very beginning of the play, Iago calls himself an ancient. I had forgotten what that word meant four hundred years ago, so I glanced at the footnotes, and I saw this. The professor picked up the book and read aloud, Ancient Ensign, the third officer in a company of soldiers. So ancient meant ensign at one time. Isn't that interesting? Fergie shrugged. Yeah, I guess so, but like my mom says, what does that have to do with the price of fish? The professor chuckled. It may not have anything to do with anything, but it set me to thinking, and my thoughts led me along some rather strange paths. All of a sudden, I started to wonder, could it be there never was an ensign French at all? Fergie's mouth dropped open. Huh? What are you talking about? The professor paused dramatically. He reached into the inner pocket of his suit coat, took out a box of Balkan Sobrain cigarettes, plucked out a black and gold cigarette and lit it. What am I talking about? He said, cocking his head to one side and smiling weirdly. Just this. All the information we have about Ensign French comes from the guidebook that Charlie Coote sent away for. The guidebook was made up by the group of people who bought the Windrow estate. And where did they get their information? From old Windrow family records. Records that were probably kept by our friend Zebulon himself. The professor paused and took a drag at his cigarette. We have not found the tomb of Ensign French, right? He went on in an excited tone. All we found was a fake sign, a door leading to some ghastly caves, and a false tomb slab. So I ask you, isn't it possible that Ensign French never existed? What if old Zeb made up all that stuff about... The, about a naval officer who married into the Windrow family. Fergie's brain was whirling. He began to wonder if maybe the professor's mind had been affected by the frightening adventures they had had in the salt caves under the church. Hey, Prof, that's really batty, he said at last. I mean, why would anybody make up something like that? The professor wrinkled his nose. I can only think of one reason, my friend.